four. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Church. And if you're worshiping with your home or out on the beach, wherever you are, just come on in, get up off your couches, and let's worship our God this morning. Here we go. this time that you would just fill us with your spirit, with each family, with each individual, whoever's watching right now and whenever they're watching, Lord, we pray for your spirit to fill us, that we would be in your presence right now as we sing of your amazing grace. Oh. 
of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who takes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the king above all
Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening or whenever you happen to be watching this. I'm glad you chose to join us today. We are continuing in a series that we've been doing on King David, the most illustrious king in Israel's history. And last week we talked about when David became king. We talked about his power and his influence over those around him. We talked about how he used that power and his influence. He had opportunities to seize power, to actually kill Saul, the prior king, who was trying to kill him. He had opportunities to seize power, but he did not because he trusted God to do what God had promised to do years earlier. And David did not feel a need to take things into his own hands. And sometimes we struggle with that. Uh, we, we all have elements of power and influence somewhere in our lives. And we have to use those like David did with humility and with gentleness to benefit other people. And, and to look for opportunities to do that. You know, all of us have opportunities. All of us have people in our lives that, that God has placed around us for, for us to influence with the things of God. And we can engage with them and we can invite them to come to understand the God that we know and to experience His grace for themselves. Now, we all have areas of influence. Sometimes we have areas of power, maybe especially over your kids. Uh, use that power to teach them, to help them grow up in the things of God so that they um, understand as they enter a difficult, difficult world as they get older. So we all have power. We all have influence somewhere. David, as king, had total power in the nation of Israel. But he did not always use his power and his influence wisely, as we're going to see today. But first, let's pray. Lord, we offer you this time. Pray that you would just help us to understand what you want us to know. That you would allow us to see deeply into the story and see what we can learn about how you interact with all of us through an episode, a, a troubling episode in the life of King David. We thank you, Lord. We ask your blessing on this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. David did not always use his power and influence wisely. And, uh, and you know, we're no different. We all do stupid things. We all sin. We, we do not keep our eyes on Christ. We don't allow God to lead us. We're like sheep wandering his way, as the Bible describes us. It's like, you know, standing in a field of grass, and we're like, ooh, grass, look at that grass over there looks better. And so we wander off to see something that isn't really any better than what we have. And that's what David does in this story. And it's a, it's a major point of sin in his life. And God forgives our sin, but there's usually a price to be paid, as there was for David. And just like we discipline our, our children, God disciplines us. Our actions have consequences. And today we'll look at what that how that played out in the life of David. Here's a scripture. As a matter of fact, this is um, the story of David. Actually, we'll go back to here. The story of David runs through almost two complete books of the Bible. And so uh, today we're going to be in chapters 11 through 18. And I encourage you to open your Bible and follow along. And, but go back and read this whole story in the books of First and Second Samuel because it's an amazing story. Um, shocking in places, encouraging in others, challenging in others. So today we're going to be in 2 Samuel 11 through 18. Now this starts with a line that some scholars find a lot of meaning in. And uh, it, it starts with saying, in the springtime when kings go to war, David was at home. And there's some people who place a lot of emphasis on that, and it's a really interesting thing, but we don't have time to go into it today. But here's the story. David was at home. His soldiers had gone off to battle, and David stayed home, and it was a beautiful day. And David got up in the morning. He did his morning things, and then later in the day, he went and took a nap, and then he got up again. And it was beautiful. And he got up and he started walking around on the, on the roof of his palace, looking around the city that was under his command, his kingdom. And as he's looking around, he notices something 
on the roof next door. There's a woman on the roof. And she's taking a bath. And he sees her and she is beautiful. Stunning. So he sends some of his servants, go find out who that woman is. And so they do. And they come back. They say her, her name is Bathsheba. She's married to a guy named Uriah, who's one of your soldiers, and he's off at war. He's off on the battlefield. And David says, bring her to the palace. So they do. And uh, David seduces her. They sleep together. And so the, the idea here is that David sees her. David wants her. And David takes her. And sometime later, Bathsheba sends a message that says, I'm pregnant. And they, this is a problem because her husband is off at war. How does she get pregnant with her husband gone? So David starts thinking how he's going to cover this up. So he sends a note out to his commander, Joab, who's out on the field. And he says, Joab, send Uriah home uh, to give me a report on the battle. So Joab does. He sends Bathsheba's husband home. And he goes to David and he gives a report on how the battle's going. And David says, thank you, Uriah. Now, you know, as long as you're in town here, why don't you go ahead and take some time and, and, and go home, you know, go see your wife. You have some wine and a meal and, and uh, just enjoy being home for a couple of days. And of course, the idea is that he sleeps with his wife and suddenly the pregnancy is explained. But Uriah says, no. I can't do that. All my comrades, they're, they're out on a battlefield. They're sleeping in an open field. I'm not going to go do this while my fellow soldiers are on the battlefield. So he goes, Uriah goes, and he sleeps on the ground with a temple guard, with a, with a palace guard. And David's like, oh, man. So the next morning, David calls Uriah in again. says, I want you to come to dinner tonight. And so Uriah does, and David gets him drunk. And says, oh, now he'll go home. Now he'll see his wife. But Uriah doesn't do it. He sleeps with a palace guard again. And so the next morning, David, being a little frustrated, a little uncertain how to deal with it, he writes a letter. It's in 2 Samuel 11, uh, starting at verse 14. It says, the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, his commander, and he gave it to Uriah. To deliver. And the letter had these instructions for Joab. Station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is most fierce. And then pull back so that he'll be killed. So Uriah unknowingly carries his own order of execution out to the battlefield. And Joab does as he is told. And Uriah is killed in the battle. Murder. Murder most foul. And so David, now with Uriah out of the way, David marries Bathsheba. And she gave birth to a son. But the Lord was displeased with what David had done. And so here's how God deals with this. Here's how God processes it. This is 2 Samuel 12, starting at verse 1. I'll just read it to you, but if you have your Bibles, follow along. And it says, So the Lord sent Nathan the prophet to tell David this story. There were two men in a certain town. One was rich. You know, rich, a man who has more than he needs. One was rich and one was poor. And the rich man owned a great many sheep and cattle. And the poor man owned nothing but one little lamb he had bought. He raised that little lamb. It grew up with his children. It ate from the man's own plate, drank from his cup, and he cuddled it in his arms like a baby daughter. But one day, a guest arrived at the home of the rich man. But instead of killing an animal from his own flock or herd, he took the poor man's lamb and killed it and prepared it for his guests. David heard the story, and David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. And he must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole, and for having no pity. And then Nathan looked at David and said, you are that man. 
You are that man. You're the one who did this, David. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house. I gave you his wives. I gave you the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. So why, David, why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? You had so much, David. Why wasn't that enough? You know, we do the same thing. Maybe not with the same details. We have, but we still want. David had many wives, at least eight probably more, and many concubines, and concubines were kind of like, they were legitimate wives, but they were of a lower stature in the palace. David had all these wives, all these women, but he wanted more. And we're much the same way. Like David, we are not satisfied sometimes with what God has given us. And there's a word for that, greed, greed. There's a reason it's called one of the seven deadly sins. You know, and in David's case, you add in lust, and things are ten times worse. I mean, look where it led David. Nathan goes on. You have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites. You used even someone else's sword here, David. You murdered him with the sword of the Ammonites, and you stole his wife. And David, there are consequences to your action. From this time on, your family will live by the sword. Now, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation, but I like the way some other translations put this. They say, the sword will never depart from your house. David, as long as you're alive, your family will be ruled by the sword. Because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. So this is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did this secretly, David, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. And now just imagine David hearing these words and hearing this sin come before him and hearing God's declaration against him that him that he the king of england or (laughs) king of england king of israel uh, will have someone take his wives and sleep with them in public view how does that affect how does that affect your heart i think a chill just strikes deep into david's heart you know how does it feel when your secret sin is exposed And then David confessed to Nathan. And he said, I have sinned against the Lord. Isn't it kind of funny how often we do not confess our sin until we get caught? David knew everything had happened. He'd gone out of his way to cover it up. But God knew. And God wasn't letting it slip by. I mean, I think this is why it happens that we virtually always get caught. And and the funny thing was, in this case, it wasn't even secret. The whole palace knew what had happened. Joab knew what had happened. But David did not confess to murder until he was confronted with it. And we're not immune to that in the church. We're no different. You know, we have things that we try to keep secret. I think we're especially dealing with it now in this time of this virus and everything and and staying at home, and, and, and it's easy to fall into addictions, substance abuse, pornography is on the rise. Watched a, a webinar last week on domestic violence as people are trapped in home together and there's, there's abuse going on. But even outside of this time of what we're dealing with, the things that we keep secret, the things we do that we hope no one is going to find out about. I knew a guy some years ago in a church that had embezzled $10,000 from his employers. I mean, how do you call yourself a Christian and embezzle $10,000? Well, you keep it a secret. You know, inappropriate relationships, 
Affairs start out as secrets. So in some ways, these are no different than what's David going through. All of these things result in lies. We have to lie to try to cover them up. To keep them in the dark. And to not even confront them ourselves. And so God tells David, you did this in secret, but the consequences will be public. And this is not because God hates us. This is not because God wants to punish us, but because he is determined to change us, to make us holy, to make us like Jesus, even if the process is uncomfortable at times. And so David admits he sins. And Nathan said, yes, you have, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. But nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the Lord by doing this, there will be a consequence, David. Your child will die. And the child did. We might think that's terrible. Why would God punish the child? But I think, I think we need to see death a little differently from, from God's perspective. I mean, we struggle so much with death and, and we mourn when our loved ones uh, pass. Because we miss them. We know we'll never see them again in this life. And that's just difficult. But for the believers who die, I mean, would you want to bring them back? Look at what the Apostle Paul writes in, in Philippians. He says, for me, living means living for Christ. But to die, oh, that's even better. That's even better. I am just here for time to accomplish this purpose. But real life begins at death. And so in light of eternity, which is promised to God's people, uh, death is not something we should fear. And David knows that. Listen to what David said when his child died. First of all, the child got ill. And David wept. And he wouldn't eat. And he laid on the ground. And he prayed nonstop for this child that the child would be healed. But that wasn't the case. The child died. And then David got up and got dressed and had something to eat and kind of resumed more of a normal at at attitude. And, and so his, his servants asked him this. Why are you being like this now that the child is, is dead? And David said, I fasted and wept while the child was alive. For I said, perhaps the Lord will be gracious to me and let the child live. But why should I fast when he's dead? Can I bring him back? I will go to him one day, but he cannot return to me. And David understood this bigger picture. Death is just a thing that happens in a, in, in a brief moment that brings us into God's kingdom. And if we learn to see death not as the end, but as the beginning of true life, we won't fear it. We'll actually welcome it. So back to the story. The sword will not depart from your household, David. Now, David had a lot of kids. He had at least eight wives. Who knows how many concubines? But his first son was a kid named Amnon. Now, he's the firstborn. He is going to be the future king, and David loves him, his first son. Now, through another wife, David had some other children. He had a son named Absalom, and he had a sister named Tamar. Tamar was beautiful. Everyone admired Tamar. Absalom was handsome too, and people admired him. But Amnon, the half-brother of Tamar and, and Absalom, he, uh, he just sees Tamar and he can hardly stand it. He convinces himself that he's in love with her. And so in love that it makes him ill because he feels like he can't really have her. He can't make this public. It's his half-sister. Amnon sees and wants. And it, it's just like David saw and wanted Bathsheba. Same kind of concept. So Amnon comes up with a scheme. He, he lays in bed like he's sick. And he tells his father, I'll feel much better if my sister Tamar will come and prepare my favorite meal and feed it to me from her hand. 
And David, I mean, that sounds like a weird request to me, but David says, okay. So Tamar goes to see Amnon, and, and she cooks him this meal. And when it's done, he says, come serve it to me in my bedroom. And when she gets there, he says, come to bed with me, my sister. Now, here's the difference between Bathsheba and Tamar. Bathsheba evidently is willing. You know, as a matter of fact, there's some speculation. She knew exactly what she was doing on the roof taking a bath. So she was willing. And it would have been difficult for her to say no to the king in a situation like that. But the difference with Tamar is that Tamar is not willing. Tamar is a virgin. And so she responds like this when Amnon propositions her. She says, no, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things are not done in Israel. Where could I go in my shame? And you would be thought of as the biggest fool in Israel. Just speak to the king. He'll let you marry me. But Amnon does not listen. And he is not going to wait. He wants her now. And so he takes her by force. And he rapes her. But things didn't turn out the way he expected. Verse 15 in his passage says, Afterwards, Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. And he said to her, Get up and get out. And she said, No, no, sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you've already done to me. But he wouldn't listen to her. And so Tamar, who's just been through this Brutal situation, dehumanizing situation. Is standing there wondering what to do. And so Amnon calls his personal servant and says, get this woman out of here and bolt the door after her. And so this servant, I picture him grabbing her by the arm roughly and dragging her out of the room and throwing her outside the door and bolting the door shut. Now, the text goes on to tell us she was wearing a richly ornamented robe. It was a special robe that the virgin daughters of the king wore. It signified who she was. It signified her place in the family and in the kingdom. But as she left Amnon's house, she put ashes on her head, which is the, uh, a form of Jewish mourning, and she tore the robe she was wearing to represent the violation. And she put her hand on her head and she went away weeping aloud as she went. Her brother Absalom saw her. And he looked at her and he knew. He said, Amnon, huh? Amnon, your brother, has been with you. And he said, Tamar, now be quiet. Just rest here. He's your brother, and so don't take this to heart. He tries to calm her down however he can. And Tamar ends up moving into Absalom's house and living there and described as a desolate woman. This is the last we hear of Tamar. You know, in that world and in that culture, no one is going to want to marry her. And Amnon had stolen her future. He had stolen her life. Well, eventually word of this comes to King David, and he's furious. But Absalom never said a word to, to Amnon, either good or bad. But he hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister, Tamar. The sword is at work in David's family. And it will not depart because of his sin with Bathsheba. And because he used the sword of the Ammonites to murder Uriah. Now that's as far as we're going to get in this story this week. But it is far from over. Far from over. And we invite you to join with us next week for that. But there's a few things I think we can learn from this. You know, many of us have things in our background that we hope never become public. They're secret things. We're ashamed of them. We want to hide them. 
and, and, and something happened that makes us feel corrupted and damaged and broken. And sometimes those are things that have happened to us, like Tamar. But often there are things that we have done, like David and like Amnon. And we try to keep them private. But the thing is, even when we make mistakes and even when things are done to us, God can transform that sorrow into joy. There are consequences, but God can transform consequences. Great is his faithfulness. And the text tells us that David was forgiven, but there were still consequences. There were still things that happened with the the wheel that he set in motion that continued. And there's a couple different ways to look at it. There's a a couple closely related words that are actually different, somewhat different meanings, and that's discipline versus punishment. Close, but not the same. Discipline has a goal. It, It looks to the future to produce better behavior to show why something is wrong. It's a teaching tool. Discipline looks to the future and is done in and through love. Punishment, on the other hand, is a way of producing suffering for something that has already passed. It has a sense of vengeance to it. But God disciplines his people. He disciplines us so that we grow and as he shapes us into the image of Christ. Now, the Bible does sometimes speak of punishment, but it's usually in reference to God's enemies. He punishes his enemies, the enemies of his people. So we have discipline, we have punishment, and one more concept, consequences. And consequences are different. They are simple cause and effect. They may or may not have a moral aspect to them, Uh, You know, if you fall off a 10-foot ladder, you're going to get hurt. That's a consequence. But it's not right or wrong. Maybe stupid, but, you know, God can use consequences as discipline, but he doesn't cause them. It's kind of a natural sequence of things. And consequences may happen even though God has forgiven us. The consequences of what we do continue even in spite of forgiveness. However, consequences do not necessarily mean that God is punishing us or even disciplining us. But even when we're dealing with consequences, God works for our good. That's the promise of Scripture that he is always working on our behalf. And that's why we can trust him. And that's why we should trust him. You know, if we trusted God more, if we trusted him enough to actually do what he says and to live the way he tells us to live, and to not do what he says not to do, we'd have less discipline. We'd have fewer consequences in our lives. And I mean, here's a really important point that we should remember. Well-behaved children don't have to deal with discipline and consequences nearly as often as children who are out of control. God wants to bless us, but we miss out because we do stupid things. Like David, we see and we want, and we take. God, through Nathan, even told David, I gave you all this stuff, David. Gave you the king. Gave you the kingdom. And if that had not been enough, I'd have given you much, much more. Why were you so unsatisfied that you had to see and want and take? And so David lost God's blessing and he had to deal with very harsh consequences because he chose to do things that were clearly evil, clearly sin. I mean, he committed the sin of adultery and then to to cover it up, he moved on to murder. That's what sin does. It feeds on itself. It starts in this little thing and then it just gets, it takes you deeper. It goes from bad to worse. And so now maybe in this time of isolation or just uh, we do this all the time regardless of isolation are we involved are you involved in some sort of improper activity stuck at home is substance abuse becoming a problem i'll tell you what sin wants to drag you down further and further into addiction this is not neutral 
There is a power trying to drag you down and it, it drags us deeper and deeper until we're miserable. That's how sin works. And, and don't think you get away with the secret stuff. God has a way of making things known in order to accomplish His purpose in your life. So here's the thing. If you want God's blessings, and I think we all do, you just have to live the way He tells you to live. God's instructions are not arbitrary rules. They're designed for your own good. And so make the decision to live as God tells us to live. But the fact is, we can't even do that on our own. We need God to give us the strength and the power to live the way He wants us to live. And, and He wants to do that for us. He wants to change us, but we have to ask for His help. We have to turn away from the way we have been living and turn to God. That is called repentance. To stop going this way and to turn around and head back towards God. And when we do that, He takes our sorrows and He turns them into joy. God can transform consequences, difficult times. And David learned that even though he lived through times of great sorrow. God was always faithful and in the end he experienced deep joy. And God gives that power to us through Jesus. He gives it to those who commit to following Jesus, who turn their lives over to him. And it starts with a, a simple prayer. And I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you that we don't face this life alone. Sometimes we feel like we do. Sometimes we act like we do. But Lord, you are always here for us. You are always calling to us, always calling us to come back to you. So Lord, I pray that you help us to do that. I pray that you help us to yield our lives to you, to allow you to change us, to, to clean us up, from beings who do such terrible things. Give us new life, your life. Lord, I offer you my life now, and I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, uh, we would like to know that. You know? So send an email or call the office, and, and we'll get in touch with you to help you understand more, maybe get you a Bible if you need one. So you can call the office, you can send an email to questions at gbcsl.com and we'll help you with that. But I encourage you to just make this commitment today. It will change your life.
Hi, Grace family. This I'm Randy, and this is my wife Janice and Hi. Buddy here, and we're just kind of hanging out, waiting for this uh, coronavirus deal to to subside, hopefully soon. And um, in the meantime, in the meantime, we're doing a little bit of gardening and uh, you know whatever else we can do. So hope you all stay safe, and we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi, I'm Shirley Parks. I've lived in Silver Lakes for almost 35 years and I'm so tired of this situation, but I pray for our country and our president every day and I pay for our pastor and his wife Julie. It's got to be hard on them, but I love these Sunday mornings when we all get together at the same time and hear the sermon and take communion. Anyway, I miss you all and I'll be so glad when we can all sit together and worship together. Okay. So bye. I'll see you when we, we can see you. <laughs> Hi. Hi. This is Hi, Richard, Mary Ann Bergstaller. And uh, we sure miss everybody over at the church, Grace Bible Church. Yes. And we, um, seems like every day is casual day now. I wore my white t shirt today <laughs> just so Julie would recognize me <laughs> because she always would laugh shirt. because when I'd work at the church, I'd always have a white t shirt on. And, uh, no. but we're spending time uh, doing puzzles and yes. a lot of yard work. I do all my own yard work, so that keeps me busy. And mm -hmm. we, uh, we are anxious to get back to church, and we, uh, we, we, we just enjoy it there so much. We enjoy Pastor Dave yeah. and Julie. Oh boy, do Julie, we ever. the musician singer. And uh, <laughs> we, uh, I guess I need to get back there and do some more work too. We've got some weeds to pull. <laughs> anyway, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, good to see you, and uh, uh, Bye. can't wait. And Bye. We'll, Take care. We hope it's soon, maybe uh, maybe another month or so with, at most. So, okay, take we, care, we, everyone. And uh, we love you and we appreciate you yeah, so much. You guys. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>